So hello, welcome back. Uh, to we're getting to the end of the first day of Sonar Plus D. This day that I like to call the quiet day because starting tomorrow, this silence that we enjoy will start becoming less and less common as this becomes more and more intense. And and. This is actually one of my favorite sessions because it's dealing with a medium and the possibilities and the ways in which different practitioners, different artists, studios, and companies are using one medium that we've taken for granted, but in that in the last 10 years have changed a lot. And this is the medium of projection. How projection has become something that has transcended the screen and has become one of the main materials, techniques, or methodologies to create new forms of experiences, sometimes dealing with this thing that we call the immersive, and other times actually amplifying or magnifying things like urban spaces and creating incredibly new popular forms. Uh, I think we're very lucky to have uh, one of the biggest companies and two of the most important practitioners in the world today, I think, extending the language and the possibilities of what the medium of projection allows. And we have actually a good excuse to really launch this program, which is the launch of uh, Sonar 360, the, the space for immersive projection 360 video that we are launching literally in a couple of hours that will be open for the rest of the festival. It's the biggest dome in Spain and one of the biggest dome in Europe. And I think that we finally have really a, a really powerful place for the wall of big scale uh, immersive uh, projection. Uh, and the people that we have here are people, for instance, who are working in companies like Media Pro Exhibitions uh, in the context of industry creating experiences in multiple languages and mediums. We have artists who have been friends of Sonar for a very long time, like Pablo Balbuena. Pablo, we were thinking, was probably almost 10 years since he made his premiere at Sonar with a incredibly sophisticated word that at that time really felt in many ways like the future. This is what the future of projection is going to be like. And I think in many ways that intuition has been validated, but he's been keep on going with his whole body of work that is incredibly personal, very sophisticated and very delicate. And Joanny Le Mercier, who last time that joined us uh, since it was three years ago, uh, was on the stages of Sonar Complex performing, has kept on doing really incredible work in this space, and we're very lucky to have them with us today. And this session is going to be run by, uh, this is a good excuse for me to tell that it's great to host you in Barcelona, but there are other Sonar Plus Ds all over the world. And I have to say that the one in Istanbul is one of my favorite ones. So if you need more of your doses of sonar throughout the year, uh, save um, uh, Istanbul for the springtime. And Lalin, Lalin Akalan is the curator for Sonar Plus D in Istanbul. And it's a really great pleasure having her running this session. So thanks all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. are these on? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, welcome everyone. We're about to begin our session on 360 immersive media. And uh, we will be beginning with uh, introducing everyone which Jose has done. Here's Pablo Valbuena, Sergi Sagas, and Juani Le Mercier with us today. And Juani will be going first with his representation. Um, his work focuses on projections of light in space and its influence on perception. Geometry, patterns, and minimalist forms uh, would, we can say, is uh, biggest aesthetic forms that he utilizes. And he will be talking today about mapping experiments, architectural projections, immersive rooms, and floating displays. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, rather tricky to, um, to, to put, I, I guess, uh, all our practices in, into uh, just one word. I guess we, we all use um, light in space. Uh, it took me many years to realize what my interest was. I, was, I started using video projectors in clubs, uh, doing VJing with musicians, and I, f I saw that was a, a nice hobby to have on the weekends. And it took me a few years to start my first experiments. And um, I, I think that specific day I had a revelation. I was in my bedroom folding paper, and I had a video projector at the back, and I did my first mapping. So really simply, I would... Um, uh, precisely map the light onto an object. Really simple, but I was blown away on how I could use then anything as a display. I didn't have to work on a rectangle, on a screen, on a, on a, on a phone. I could use any, any surface as a canvas for projection. So I started doing um, geometrical sculptures, uh, first with paper, always with really simple 
simple shapes. I guess that was a little easier at the beginning to do simple lines and stuff. Um, I, there's something quite magical when you start seeing um, an object or a sculpture that glows, that emits light, when you don't expect uh, paper or, or foam to, to emit such things. So that I think the sort of magical aspect, uh, the surprise you would get as a, as a spectator is the, one, the first thing that really got me into this. Then I did a lot of experiments. Um, my back, I did a bit of graffiti in my younger years, so I started doing painting and, and see how I could use the projected light and the projector as, um, as a layer of light over my drawings and over my graffitis to sort of experiment with perception. And I, I liked it how on the, on the right side, it sort of feels like your drawing is sort of popping out. And I didn't know what I was doing then. I was just experimenting, and I wasn't sure what, that I would actually work as an artist in the next few years. And I teamed up with um, another few artists. We started a label called AntiVJ. We started doing installation, larger works, projection change onto sculptures. Um, we did a lot of architectural projections uh, back in the days, where basically we would use the facade as a canvas. Um, when we started, we didn't really know what, our, what we wanted to say. We were more like experimenting. And it took a few years to actually realize that uh, we perceive reality mostly through light. When you look around, around, around us, um, you sort of define the reality and the world with the light that sort of bounces off elements and then uh, that gives you a sense of space and perception. And I realized that with uh, projection mapping, you could control the light so precisely that you could almost change reality in a way. Um, because as you change the way things look, you sort of have this ability of, um, of sort of morphing the world, changing the architecture. So it was, um, I think, a starting point after maybe four or five years of projection mapping. I realized that what I liked was just to, to mess around with perception, to like, um, almost question the, the very notion of reality. If it's so easy with a projector to change the shape or the, or the color or something, how can you tell that maybe it's, it's not the real shape or the real object? Uh, so all my work since then has been about perception and, uh, and, and architecture, of course, was a, a big uh, interest for me and for the group. Uh, we had a chance to, uh, to do projects in, uh, in cathedrals, in churches, in um, also this, this project was very interesting. It was our first permanent piece in Wroclaw in Poland. And uh, it was built 100 years ago. So, uh, and, and also working in cathedrals, of course, you're not in a club anymore. You're not in, a, in just doing entertainment. You have to sort of think more about what you want to say, think what, what, your, what the meaning is. And so we started doing a lot of research on the, on the architecture itself, on the history of the city, uh, and we try to, to put more meanings and, and define more um, what, what our pieces were. Uh, and sk skipping through a lot of different things, so I won't go really deep into e each of the projects, but it's just to sort of give you a, an overview. So working with architecture was a little tricky because you work with what you get. There's a facade, you can't really change it, you can't really, uh, you can use light to sort of make it move, but you, you, you can't really define your own architecture. So I, I then started to, um, to, to develop and to design installations where I could actually make my own shape, my own structure, define my own architecture, which is um, an easier way to, uh, to also define your, your story and, and, and your content. Uh, so I did a series of installations called Blueprints. Um, it was hosted by, uh, and, and curated by uh, the Stripe Biennale um, in the Netherlands and commissioned by Angelique Spanix. And it was one of the first time I had a chance to, 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 to build my own architecture in a way, architecture of light. And this piece is about um, patterns in the cosmos and in architecture. It's a, it's a long, long story short, but uh, I really, I didn't want to have just a projection on a wall or on a facade. I wanted to create a space that you see from a distance and then you get closer. And, and as you get closer, it's, you, so the space defines itself. And you, depending on when you are, you get a completely different perspective and a completely different view on, on the installation. And there was actually a sweet spot on the top left image. There's that one point of anamorphosis, where actually some of the patterns you could see from an angle 
uh, they make sense and they form uh, a single image. And I like this idea of whether, um, depending on, on your point of view, you might see different things and you might have a different experience of perception. Uh, I love the work of Victor Vazarelli, um, uh, sorry, uh, Felice Varini in that case, who does a lot of, uh, of anamorphosis and it's been a great uh, inspiration for this project. So as you see, I've been trying a lot of different formats and I guess the common thing between those projects is the, the, the immersive aspects. You're not looking at something, you might as well be inside the, the, the installation or inside the display. Um, probably gonna skip the, the stage design uh, part. Um, part of these experiments was how, how can I bring some light and some, some visuals on stage? Did a couple of projects um, for festivals and one with uh, Flying Lotus. Um, I'm skipping through a little bit. So part of the, the experiment it, I wanted to make, um, I really wanted to step into a room where you could have, a, I don't like the word, a, like fully immersive experience. It doesn't, it no longer means much now that you have VR uh, headsets and it, it's hard to sort of define these words, but I wanted the ability to step into a room and to have um, a continuous experience, wh wh whether you look in front of you or behind, or that, that would be something sort of seamless um, uh, experience. And I was really inspired by the work of Sol Lewitt, uh, who decided that uh, maybe instead of taking a canvas and like paint inside a rectangle, he would actually take the whole room and, uh, and cover his visuals and, 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 and uh, uh, develop his piece not on a small screen or on a small canvas, but actually fill the world space to create a different experience. There's a different uh, scale religion, relationship with the work as well. So yeah, I went to Dia Beacon a few years back and I was really loved this experience, the experience you get when you step into these rooms. Um, so I started work, working on wall drawings. Uh, the idea is to uh, cover the walls of a room with, uh, with drawings, uh, with marker pen. Uh, define your own canvas, draw your own geometry and structure, and then use a layer of light and projection um, to then bring, bring some life to the, to, to the images. And a lot of the work is it's either um, about landscapes or minimal geometry. I'm trying to explore other things. I um, do a few projects about Cosmos as well, but I'll always get back to these uh, geomet geometrical landscapes, whatever happens. Um, so here are a few projects. Of so it's sort of immersive. You can still feel like you're in a room, but there was something really interesting of seeing the physically the drawing on the wall, but also the light bringing you some shadows and some depths and, and, and some narratives uh, to, to sort of augment um, the, the, the experience. Uh, this is my super producer, Juliette, that is doing a, a workshop on Friday, I think. Um, they, it's, this is a more recent project we did in South Korea where we did uh, 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 four walls co um, representing a, a, land, a, a really, really still landscape. And so from this I was like, oh, how can I get even more immersive? How can I even maybe remove the walls and uh, create an experience uh, where you f almost forget about the, the space itself. Uh, so one iteration was a residency I was lucky to be part of in, um, in uh, Manchester uh, in 2013. This place is weird, it's a cave in a university, it cost uh, probably a million pound or something. There are some weird, um, these screens are Fresnel lenses um, that gives you perfectly linear brightness, so you don't really see the screen anymore. You have 3D glasses, you have tracking system, so the, the, the computers know exactly where you are in the space, and this is how immersive a, a, as you get, theoretically. But um, yeah, it was quite challenging technically to use this, this content, and we spent countless hours trying to make this work and um, at the end we did like very sort of minimal aesthetic so this is my friend Kyle McDonald and uh, Elliot Woods was also part of the residency. So quite interesting but the, the we had a lot of limitations with the computers and the software and the system so it was just a, a first experience. A few years later I was uh, lucky enough to be invited for a residency at La Sat, well actually on the festival and also uh, uh, they have a, a screening program. 
and uh, different experience. Um, you, you don't have projection on the floor, but obviously you have a much more um, uh, immersive space uh, above you. With any dome project comes a set of um, uh, restrictions. Um, so I, saw the, I, I did a short residency in the space. I was really amazed on, uh, about the possibilities. And I wanted to do a piece about nature. So I bought a, a little uh, GoPro rig to, to film 360 content um, in the nature. And I spent three months shooting a lot of, of material, and I was really excited. I went back to Lassat, and then I realized that you can't just do, uh, you can't project anything. There's a, uh, everything you want. So there are a lot of things that won't work. You can't put too much brightness in the dome, because if you light up the space, then you see the space, you see everyone, it takes you out of the experience. So I did a lot of, a lot of uh, research and development to understand better the, 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 the constraints and the possibilities. And uh, lately, I, uh, I did another project in a dome um, about, uh, called Nebulae, uh, about cosmos and geometry, again, my, my obsessions. Uh, so these are a few images uh, that looks a bit distorted, but it's actually the full image um, you project on the wall dome. So a flat version doesn't look um, very good. Juliette again in uh, last year when we presented Nebula in uh, in South Korea. So there's a lot of potential. There are a few pieces in the dome here that you will see uh, uh, this week, I guess. And I wanted again part of my experiments was to even try to remove completely the screen. So over the past um, couple of years, I did a lot of uh, projection tests on mist and atomized water to hopefully have this sort of holy grail of having light floating in space. Um, I did this small interactive test. Um, it's just on the R&D phase at the moment. But uh, um, yeah, I, I want to even get rid of, of, of the space itself. And uh, it's really difficult. It comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, and the way you produce the content is um, really specific. Uh, but I guess that's uh, something I want to keep exploring. and. Um, uh, so that what I'm showing here is mostly technical. Uh, I always struggle to explain the, the artistic project in a short amount of time, um, and there are so many projects here. But uh, we have this this new piece called uh, Constellation. Um, there is a, a, a larger scale installation that we show in public space. Uh, it's very re a, a very recent project. Um, Probably not as immersive as, as the dome, uh, because you sort of stand in front of the, um, uh, of the projection. But there's the fact that you're not looking at the screen anymore, and you can step into the, 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 the display, and you can almost, there's a tangible sense with the light, with the wind. The screen sort of moves, the water moves. So you can almost touch the, the, the image, and, and there's something quite fascinating, that sort of relationship with, with the, the, the image you, uh, you're projecting. Um, I think that's already 15 minutes. Um, I hope it wasn't too, uh, I hope it made a, a bit of sense, and uh, can't wait to discuss more with, the, with you guys in a bit. It did make sense. Thank you for that. And uh, I think uh, after we hear other presentations, we can get back to what you were talking about, creating content for immersive environments and the constraints that we need to consider while doing that. And then uh, now I'd like to pass to Pablo Valbuena. Uh, he's an incredible artist that works uh, with architectural spaces in a very subtle, uh, not an extremely digitized fashion. Um, and we can say that his work uh, is a journey through spaces. And he'll be talking more about the immersion from the perspective side of the artist and talk about his recent projects, Gyrotope, a bit more. Gyrotope, sorry. Thanks for the, for the introduction. Um, the clock started. You don't see it, but there's a huge <laughs> clock in front of us that it's quite as stressful. And, and at some point, it turns red. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm not even going to try to, to cram a lot of... I I, Johnny, I don't know how you managed, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not capable of uh, cramming that many projects in such a, an amount of time. So I'm going to speak about two projects. Uh, but on the other hand, I would like to uh, sort of contextualize a bit what means immersion. No? The panel is about 
uh, immersive experiences. I, I, I would like to, to talk a bit what does it mean from the perspective of the artist. And uh, I think the first thing that probably is important to point out is that uh, the artist, what, what we artists want, want is to, to create experience that for the observer is meaningful, something that it's uh, going to change the way someone sees the world, understands the world around uh, themselves. No? So I guess the, the, the first, for me, the first important thing to say is that immersion is not a goal, it's a tool. It's a tool to, to achieve that meaningful experience, but, and it's a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool because it's a universal language. It's not, it's not necessarily culturally specific. It's something that uh, immersion talks with the language of time, of space, of perception. So it's something that uh, suddenly widens the, the range of, of public that you can reach. No? So um, when we talk about immersive experiences, we talk about experiences that are artificially created, but uh, at the same time, they, have, they look, they feel uh, potentially real. They feel like they actually can happen. No? Um, and there are two ways to, or two approaches to, to work with immersion, with immersion, with uh, immersive experiences. One is that of isolating, taking the subject and actually building a sort of cocoon, a sort of uh, frame around that subject and isolating it completely from reality. That's the, the example of VR or, or film, where you create an environment that it's actually uh, cancelling all the inputs from, from the exterior, from reality, and replacing them with the inputs you create. That means that you have created a new reality from scratch, which, which is quite... Uh, you need a lot of resources to do that. You need also to know how to do that. And the second approach is actually that of unframing, of working with the context. And that's, I think from, from my point of view, that's the most interesting approach. That's where I see that the most interesting projects happen. And it's basically, instead of forcing these, new, these sort of artificial realities, actually taking those tools of immersion and bringing them using them on top of reality, it's building on top of what is actually there. So you can get a much more nuanced, uh, layered uh, experience. No? Because you have already all that information that it's already there. I think a quite, hopefully, visual analogy to, to the history of painting is how uh, uh, painting is born uh, in relation to a space. No? The first paintings are in architecture, they are related to architecture, they are painted directly in architecture, and at some point the frame of the painting appears, which is quite recent actually, and separates, tries to separate for functional, for economical reasons, separates the, the painting from the wall. No? This would be like an example of the first approach, while this would be, in terms of painting, an example of the second, no? which is the Santa Maria Preso San Satiro from uh, Bramante, which is a trompolale, where you can see that the frame of the painting is not anymore something that is trying to, to differentiate. It's ra rather than that, the frame is the architecture itself. And what is interesting for me in this picture is that you have, there are elements of the frame of the architecture that are present in the painting and the other way around. So you create an experience where there's not any more a difference between what is real, what is, what is real and what is virtual, what is real and what is artificial. There's a smooth transition. And what is interesting for this approach, of this approach is that your brain starts to not differentiate what belongs to reality or, or what doesn't. So you can pass as real things that are maybe, in principle, we wouldn't understand as, as real. I just want to note two examples that for me are interesting uh, and they are quite far from technology. I did this on purpose, but they use very e sort of economical mediums, minimal mediums in order to achieve this sense of immersion. One is the, the work of Janet Cardiff and George uh, Bures Miller, who you probably, m some of you may know, they are these sun walks with where basically Janet Cardiff uh, overlaps uh, in binaural audio 
in an binaural recording that it's done through a space. She overlaps her thoughts about the space. Her, he con she contextualizes a lot what's going on. She tells a story. And it's a very powerful, intimate experience with really minimal mediums. And this other piece is a piece by uh, American artist Michael Asher. Uh, and what he does, he's given this, this exhibition space on top of a tower in New York. And what, what he does is basically remove uh, all his action is to remove all the frames and doors of this space. So, uh, so he, he basically uh, connects all the, the exterior, all the noise, all the wind that is outside of the space and sort of unframes the, the exhibition space, sort of uh, making this bridge between uh, between what is outside and what is inside. This is quite probably quite a, he's a conceptual artist, this is quite an extreme position, but I think it's really elegant and it's, it's um, what I'm trying to, to get, where I'm trying to get here is that uh, sometimes it's not necessary to be too complicated to add a lot of stuff. Sometimes you can achieve more actually but by, by, uh, by, uh, uh, by reducing, no? by really focusing on, on a few things. And that is probably a good segue, just eight minutes, it, uh, time runs fast. Uh, uh, this is a good segue to my own practice, which is uh, looking back at my work in the, in the last 10, 12 years, what I noticed is that I have been, when I'm dealing with light and with sound, I'm, I'm following this process of unframing uh, but thinking about the digital display, I'm, I'm using pixels, which are, which are basically uh, the single elements that are in an array in a digital display where you can control time with a pixel because it, it has a, a framing, no? it's, it's like film, it has a, a refresh rate, but you also, has, you also have a, a position of the pixel, and the, the position of the pixel is meaningful in a 2D plane, it doesn't I mean, you cannot interchange the position of the, of the pixel, that the image would be different. So what I, I think my, my process, conceptual process, if you want, is that I'm taking, I'm unframing the display, the digital display, I'm taking these pixels into a space. This is probably what I was doing here in the augmented sculpture, where I was projecting these pixels into a sculpture and mm, into a, an object, and overlapping the real sculpture with uh, a 3D model of the, of the real sculpture uh, and making the transformations on the digital model and then projecting back, filming that back in sort of in virtual space and projecting back to reality through a projector. This evolved into, uh, into, into projects where uh, the immersion grew in the sense that they were based on real spaces. It was much more contextual. It also, I think it's something you can see in this, in this picture quite clearly, you know, where you have all these different levels of real architecture, real architecture with virtual projection, and at the end, actually, a 2D projection. And all these layers that have a different degree of sort of virtualization, they become one. And this is what interests me. This, this sort of dream-like state that you can generate as an artist where everything is real, or everything is potentially real. Uh, these types, the, the, the projects have been growing, also in terms of scale, and this is a project, uh, this is one of the two projects that I'm going to talk about uh, more in depth, uh, if I have the time. Uh, and uh, this is a, a piece that is a Garrod Austerlitz in Paris, and in this case I stopped using projection and I start using direct light, also projected light, but in a much more to achieve a larger scale in a much more reduced resolution. And uh, the basis of this project was how actually motion could be depicted when you're in a train. It was a project specific for, uh, for a future train station, high-speed train station. So I was really interested in how this perceptual space inside a, a train and how you can only perceive a speed, uh, uh, perceive a speed through the passing of, of light, so the sequencing of light. So uh, I intervene in this space where and I identify this repeating element, which was the column, and I took the column as a pixel. And 
what was for me important in this project is that uh, the, the, it's the first project I did where uh, the, the use of sound was meaningful in a different way. Like sound is not used as sound, it's used uh, as a space. And uh, let's say that I, it's the first project where I use sound as I would use light. It was, it was, sound was treated as uh, the same way as light, and it was not that important what was sounding, it's, it was important where and when was sounding. The last work I want to show is, is an evolution of this principle into a more sort of precise piece. It's a, a standalone piece, so it's not contextual, it's, it's less contextual, but it's dealing with the same idea of, it's a perimeter of columns where light and sound takes place. And uh, what was important about this piece is like how this installation dealt with sort of an idea of, of sculpture in motion no? and how you could depict something with light, a volume with light, but you could at some point close your eyes and actually see with sound in, in, in some way. No? So you could actually depict... It's, it's a bit tricky to talk about these pieces because they are really they are very physical in the way you experience them. So, uh, But basically, at some point, you could close your eyes and listen and see. You could make an image listening of what you were seeing visually. Because the, the, the sound is literally treated uh, in, in a space. This idea of pixel is taken to the visual part, but also to the, to the sound part.
I guess I guess that's it. The the, the clock is flashing like crazy. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation. And now we'll move forward to Sergi Sagas. Uh, he's the director of creative technologies and the co-director of exhibitions at Media Pro, which as Jose suggested, it's one of the leading uh, audiovisual content producers and distributors in Europe. And he'll be talking about some of his projects, uh, but specifically about one VR experience project that is called the Zone of Hope. And there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope to give you as much, uh, as much content and uh, value as, as possible in this uh, short time we have together. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you that at Media Pro, we have a time machine. And we were able to travel in time 50 years in the future uh, and take this picture of the, um, of the Plaza de España here in, right next to us. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm just checking to see if you're paying attention because it's late in the day. So this is just a frame of the uh, Zone of Hope experience, and I'll be telling you a little bit about it uh, later. So at Media Pro, we, we, don't have a, we don't have a time machine yet. What we do is we, we, do, uh, we are a storytelling company. We, sent, we focused on content, and mostly uh, we have everything around content to, pr to produce um, that we need. So we have technology, rights management, broadcasting, and uh, different things. So if we focus on content, we do a lot of different things, like from film to TV to uh, events and exhibitions, which is the, the division that I uh, know better at Media Pro. And then it, it, when we look at the exhibitions, again, there's uh, museums, pavilions. So I guess I'm, I'm here to give the, uh, the commercial side of, um, of, of some of these uh, immersive experiences and immersive uh, spaces. So. Uh, basically, this is a video that you can see some of the latest work we've done. It's uh, two minutes long. So we basically like to tell stories with spaces and using, using technology only as a tool to basically let us tell our, our tales and, and tell stories and make people experience uh, different, different worlds and different spaces. So I'm going gonna, gonna to focus on two um, cases that illustrate a little bit uh, some, of the, some of the work. So we do, at Media Pro, we do a lot of um, uh, sports uh, with the, our TV broadcasting site does a lot of sports. So obviously, when we get a new technology, the first thing we do is just try it. 
So obviously at Naive, um, as we did, and this was back many years ago, actually this, this picture is not taken on our uh, team, but we just placed, placed um, a camera, a 360 camera in a football um, field, and that's what we got, which was completely useless to tell a story of a, of a game, which is what we are uh, want to do. So for us, when we do broadcasting of the uh, La Liga, the, the football teams, we, in a way, that's telling the story of what's going on in that space, which is the, 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 the field. And technology not always solves your problems, no matter how flashy and, and hype it is. So in this case, obviously, this um, doesn't, doesn't work to tell a story of football. But instead, we came up with um, another solution that there's a, there's a video about it that I'll show you. Welcome to a new side of football. Get ready to stop watching and start feeling. That was how you watched a match up until now. That was watching a goal. That was watching a play. That was being a spectator. But from now on, you can dive into football like never before. Choose exactly what you want to watch. Analyze statistics. Select entirely new footage. And take your place in the game. Get your viewing gear on and dive into the future. So this is just the rethinking of how to use immersive technology to, to show um, a game, in this game, a, a football game. At, uh, at Media Pro, we've done many projects using immersive technologies from um, a project we did back in 2013 in Brazil, uh, which is what you see in there on the, on the top uh, right, um, all the way to the Zone of Hope, which is basically the, the project that I'm going to present. The Zone of Hope is basically a, a totally immersive experience that is open here in Barcelona. And you can all go and see it. It's going to be open until January 2019. And the idea, the premise here is to, to enter a world that suppose that nobody does anything about climate change. So what would the world look like in 30 years, 50 years, and 75 years? And then the idea is to use this medium, this, this platform, immersive medium, to, to tell the story of how to change people's mind and to change, to, to make people react, not, not just much as a, as a game, but as something that makes people think and experience something in a way that would not be possible any other way. So here's a, a sneak peek of, the, of the, the show. Why would you care about something you can barely even see or feel? There's only one way to stop climate change, and that's by experiencing it. We transport over 100,000 visitors into the future to experience firsthand the impact from climate change. Using VR immersive extreme technology has allowed visitors to experience a glacier melting, the desertification of a reservoir, and the flooding of Plata de España in Barcelona. Subjected to extreme temperatures, Exhibition goers had to face challenges as a team. The Zone of Hope is a groundbreaking exhibition created and developed by Media Pro that will leave a lasting impression of the impact of climate change on those who experience it. Welcome to the Zone of Hope. VR immersive extreme technology from LabSit MVR is unique worldwide and differs from a conventional VR experience in that the geometry of both the virtual and physical spaces is identical. El Ranchito, creators of the Game of Thrones Dragons, were commissioned to build and animate the post-climate change world. The team at LabSid were responsible for installing and calibrating their innovative technology. 15,000 visitors in the first six months. 5.4 million Facebook impacts. What's <gasps> up? Spectacular. It's like Blade Runner, no? Voila. 5.2 million Instagram impacts. 
Major presence in mainstream media. The Zone of Hope's goal is to stir a change in the people of Barcelona, a way to increase awareness about sustainability. The Zone of Hope has been a phenomenal success and a step forward in the fight against climate change. Produced and developed by Media Pro for Icos de Barcelona. The Zone of Hope: A different future is possible. So, since I still have about five minutes, I'm gonna. Uh, oh, by the way, this is another project we're doing. We're doing now a, a big theme park in China about sports and the figure of uh, Leo Messi, but that's gonna be coming in uh, uh, sooner next year. So that was just a sneak peek of what uh, we're doing there. I can talk to you, some of you, uh, later if you have um, more questions about this. Uh, now that I still have five minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture into a presentation that I, uh, that I normally do in half an hour, 45 minutes. But I think it has some points. I'll, I'll go just to the main points. I think it has some interesting uh, ideas that we can use later in the talk. So the idea of the immersive media is basically to bring people to another reality and to expand what reality means. So when we say people bring people to another reality, it means to bring them to the live event or to bring them to a magical moment in a movie or to an animated world or to completely different worlds. So since the beginning, since the very early times, humans, we are storytellers, not just media pro, but human beings are storytellers. So we've used every technology available to tell a story. So back in times, um, a campfire was the best technology we had to tell stories. Uh, we had to obviously to use our imagination. Then came books, and books also help us write our imagination on paper so people can uh, still, obviously, when you, when you read a book, you can go and go to another world. Um, the more sophisticated media got with the arrival of, uh, of um, film 100 years from now, people started seeing more possibilities of how to travel to these worlds and, and change worlds. When we had TV and many other um, ways to express and see things a lot more clearly, more resolution, better graphics, uh, start, start exploding the possibilities. But we were still looking at the glass. We were still looking through a window. And what we, what we want to do ultimately is change this window from window to basically a door, a door that let us go in a new reality, a door that let us experience um, something else completely different, far away from where we are, or even completely impossible. And, and the big promise for this uh, now is virtual reality. But obviously, virtual reality is nothing new. And also, around virtual reality, there's all these other concepts and, um, and things that people get people very confused. So I'm just with one graphic, I'm going to try to uh, make. Uh, most of you already know this, but just to get a, a graphic. So 360 video, basically, is, is, is still reality. So you look around, you see, you see the world. Augmented reality is when you overlay graphics on top of the real world. Uh, mixed reality is basically a, an enhanced version of, uh, um, of augmented reality with more detailed shadows and uh, objects, collisions, and stuff like that. And virtual world is when we create a, a world from scratch. So basically, it gives you the ability to completely create a new world and transfer people to the new world. Uh, one important aspect is uh, visuals. Uh, but that's not the only aspect. Visuals are important. There's, there's live action, there's computer graphics, and there's things in between that basically let, let you have the best of both worlds. But as I said, visuals are not the main thing. There's immersion, audio, touch, uh, smell, um, and different sensations that makes you really travel to this, to this place. Then there's mobility. This is important that you know, there's a look around, you stay in place, and you look around. Or you can lean around and, and, and move and have a little parallax. Or you can just ultimately you can walk around in a space in true, uh, freely, so you can experience this world in a much more, uh, a much more, uh, a much better uh, way to experience it. Uh, I have a minute left, a minute and 25 seconds, so um, I'll just uh, story again. This is nothing new. This is the third wave of uh, of VR. Um, hopefully now it's here to stay. VR still has some challenges, both technical, um, but also, and more importantly for this talk, uh, in terms of content. So it has a lot of content challenges still in terms of narrative language. How to tell a story in VR is not easy. It's not the same as when we have a square 
Uh, we don't have much time to, to talk on this now, but maybe later we'll have a chance to touch on it. BR formats, uh, the, the UI, how, how you interact in, uh, in an immersive area, that's, rare, that's also really important. And obviously, also to find business models like everything else, some, someone has to um, sustain some of these uh, advantages and, and make them reach more, more people. So 30 seconds left. The last um, challenge is also obviously social. So you know, what it is, nobody knows what it is to stay um, many hours isolated in a, in a virtual world. Probably nothing good will, ha will come from that. So we'll have to learn how to deal with this in terms of social uh, challenges. So then right on cue, uh, 10 seconds left. That was my presentation. So thank you. I hope that we have a time to, to talk a little bit more. And um, some, hopefully some, t some other time, we'll be able to talk about more about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Sergi, for sure. your presentation. Uh, we have a very little time left, I think. So I'd like to summarize the conversation that we've had in the backstage. Uh, I was asking all of them, but mostly Joanny, about uh, abstraction versus uh, specificity, fig figuration, and ne integrating narrative into the immersive experience. And he was telling me that maybe with abstraction, it's easier to dwell, uh, enter into that reality because there's no real comparison with the real world if you're just seeing very abstract geometric shapes. Uh, but with figurative, uh, then you will have more comparison, and then that will kind of, that might not necessarily um, decrease that experience. And from that, we started talking about uh, constraints uh, of producing work for immersive media. And then we went into why would we want to be immersive in the first place, why would any artist or any person need for immersion? Uh, so this is a question for all of you, I guess. Uh, first, why would we want to be immersed? Uh, what, is, what do you think? This, there's an instinctual need for this, because uh, as technology is advancing, I guess this is a very, this is the output of our own internalization of this society, so this should be quite in, incentric to us in a way. And the second question is how can we be immersive or immersed without the utilization of technology? And just to leave you with a note there, it comes to mind to me Lord of the Rings. For some reason after all of this, it made me think of Lord of the Rings before all of the movies just as a literature piece with no visuals or graphics uh, or a reality that is already constructed for you to experience, for you to be immersed, just with Frodo's journey, which is an experience in itself, uh, to go out into this kind of created world by Tolkien with all the map and all the other places. And how does that uh, play into our lives, maybe? It's a very big question. Uh, <laughs> I guess maybe the, f the first question, uh, and I'm not sure how to answer, why do we use these immersive formats? Mm -hmm. Why do we use these technologies? Um, I, I think it's just uh, it's nothing new with artists using technology. I think um, in, in, it's always been the case. Uh, it's funny to see how in the past there was less um, uh, separation between uh, the scientist and the artist when you see how um, well, the most famous one, I guess, Da Vinci, uh, was a scientist, a researcher. He was doing uh, mathematics. He was studying uh, the cosmos and, and space, but also painting. Uh, he was also an architect. And, and uh, I guess the Renaissance was probably the, um, the, the period where there was less boundaries between things. Uh, I guess you were just interested in, in, in the world, in the, the world we live in. Um, and, and then you're also interested in the sort of uh, uh, upcoming technologies. If you want to paint, uh, maybe he wanted to use the latest uh, kind of paint that would last longer. Or the so I guess using the, the technology of our time feels really natural as an artist. It wouldn't... Uh, I, I like also doing drawings and using painting, but since I use computers in my daily life and it's taken a, lo a lot of space in our society and in our uh, daily life, I guess it feels really natural just to use what's there to, uh, to, to create. 
and um, and uh, yesterday was projection mapping. Tomorrow it's a VR headset. So it doesn't really matter to be honest. It's just the tools that are maybe a little more exciting than the paint and brush. Uh, I also like painting, but there's a bit of a feeling that maybe we might do something that uh, has a sort of a sense of novelty and that will allow us to explore and to create a new experience for the for the the, the viewer. Uh, I guess for, for my point of view, that's the only reason I use technology because there's a sense of um, maybe more potential in the, the experience I want to create. But I also love, um, if I had to, to stop using computers tomorrow, I'll be happy just to use a candle and a piece of paper and I would probably explore the same ideas, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, would about you that contribute Yes, to that? about what you were saying what I mean, I, I agree that there's this sort of primal attraction to, to anything that feels, to any immersive experience. And I think that's related to, to the act of dreaming, to the, to the act of projecting yourself into a place that it's not maybe here, it's not maybe now, but it's potentially here or potentially now. So it's a way, and that's basically what artists do, is to try to, to, to make real something that that maybe uh, it's not yet there. No? So I think there's something, there's a link between dreaming and being in an immersive experience that it's quite, I agree, quite, quite primal. And uh, there has been several times where books uh, appeared in the, in the presentation, and I think it's, it's really interesting. For instance, it's rare the situations where you read a book and you see a film, and you say, yeah, the film was much better than the book. No? Uh, how, <laughs> how, how many times that happens? No? So I think this is a good sort of uh, reflection on what do we mean by being immersive? Because maybe you don't need actually all that, uh, uh, all that resources, all that to actually do something that can be done much better in a different way. You know? So it doesn't necessarily mean that more technology means more immersion, but it's actually giving the right input for even the mental realm to be generating itself into a fantasy uh, or an alternative reality. I, I think that the problem is that the, the technological sort of race is making the, the tool make it look like the goal. And that's, I think that's part of the, part of the problem. I would say I think there's, um, there's two that separate things. One is immersive. The, the reason why uh, immersive media is appealing to us is because we live in a 3D space. And uh, that's, we are familiar with the 3D space. And we like to look around. And we are curious creatures. So we look around in different directions. So that's innate in us to, to want to explore. And when we explore, we explore in 3D. And uh, immersive media, immersive um, any kind of media uh, that is immersive not necessarily tied to technology. I mean, there's, there's a book can be immersive in a way that if the characters have depth, if the, the spaces are well-defined and better detailed, it can be extremely immersive to be at home just reading a book. So it, it's not really completely tied uh, immersion and, and technology. In terms of technology, obviously, all these new technologies l makes us easier in a way. Uh, in some other ways, it makes it a lot more complicated, but it makes it easier to, to appeal to more people. Because uh, more people than, you know, a lot of people is easier to go watch a movie than read a book. Uh, even though the, the book experience might, might be much more immersive and much better. The same way uh, when you create content that is for many, many people and you want many people to enjoy it, creating a virtual reality or a, or a dome or something like this is something that, that immediately takes people in this new reality. As opposed to, you know, other memes that are, take longer. Uh, I think next summer should be about books. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it> <laughs> that made me also think about how we could be immersed in fake news, and that's an alternative reality in itself as well. So immersion is much bigger than any art project. Or we, I think we have got a nice consensus there. But to take the discussion back to <laughs> where it should be, uh, I just wanted to ask you how you see the future of immersive media 
Would it be something similar to Elon Musk's neural lace where we don't need any equipment or like where we could give tactile or physical sensations through cognitive processes and just kind of dream in our beds forever? Or wh where do you see this going personally? I, I don't, from my perspective, I don't really know if, I don't know if I like what I see where it's going. I mm. don't think so. But when I was trying to, to, to actually identify when you were talking about books, to identify why a book is so strong. And actually, there's something about that the book is not giving all the information that you need to depict, to depict that reality. It's, it's actually, it's forcing you to fill the gaps. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very important part, no? how if you give too much and you, and you try to actually reproduce reality, you're, I think you're missing the point. Actually, it works better when you leave things open and you leave the, and you can, you leave the, the, the subject, the person who is experiencing to dream actually, to project themselves into, into that experience. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, well our, oh, sorry, do you, no, do you it's, want it's, I, I think it's the, the, a great point that yeah. whatever technology we use, it's never get any closer to a good book. You open a book, you are in a different world, and the, and I, I guess in a hundred years' time we won't be we won't be much closer uh, because the book is still going to be so much more powerful than what what pixels or whatever gimmicky thing you put. Mm. So before we take questions, I think we can finalize with uh, Steven Spielberg's last movie's last uh, scene: "Is reality is always more real." So, <laughs> so any questions? I think there's one. Um, I would like to know your opinion on uh, the um, hmm, how it can be different to experience content and especially storytelling inside an isolated VR experience versus collectively with people inside a space. Does it make any sense, like sure. the question? Yeah, I, I think I can take that uh, first shot because um, social we obviously we're social creatures so being social is very important i didn't mention uh on this but you can nowadays do vr that is collective experience and zone of hope is an example of it so when you enter um the, the zone of hope you enter with four different well, actually with three more people so it's a it's a collective on, on groups of four and you can interact with them you can touch and this is a really really important thing to have, to have the ability to see other people. Because one of the things that it's really isolating about VR in general is that you know, most VR experiences you're alone in a world that you cannot touch anything or move much. And then hopefully you know, with more technology, and not just technology actually, more important than technology is the storytelling behind it with good ideas behind it that drive, that will drive the technology. The technology will happen anyway. So the, the, the important thing is to find innovative ways to use and nowadays, it's definitely possible to to have uh, shared experiences in VR that are that go much beyond you know seeing other worlds, but also touching them and moving through them, and uh, and still keep some space to to your imagination to to create like when you walk around a new space, you start making ideas in your head, and then you know. So that's 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 it's here. I was going to say it's coming, but it's it's here already. Uh, I think there's a question there. Um, thank you very much. What is the personal biggest challenge for each of you right now in terms of the impact you would like to achieve with your work and maybe where that bleeding edge for you is? Impact. In, impact in, in which, when you're, you're asking about impact, you're, uh, you're asking about what, what type of impact do you do? You the change we want to bring to the world. <laughs> yeah. What is what is the change you want to bring to the world with what you do? I mean, today we live in times that are very political. Everything that we're choosing to do in some way is about, you know, action or inaction in face of what is happening. So what are you thinking with that? I think from a personal perspective, what, what, I've, what I want with my work is to place 
the, the people who, who are looking at the work in a position where they have to challenge in, a, in some way what they know. No? And, and for me, that's, it's maybe not a straightforward sort of political position, but it's quite a political position. I mean, it's, it's putting, it's challenging, basically, people. I think that's the role of art in, in, in many ways. And challenging is not saying what you have to think or what you don't have to think. It's actually facing, it's sometimes, sometimes it's just putting yourself in a mirror and actually saying what, I mean, what I am, what I'm doing here, what I'm, I mean, is, is all these things that I already learned, are these true? They apply or should I question them? No? That's my personal... For, for me, I would say one important aspect is to find ways to use this technology in meaningful ways, to basically change people. Obviously, entertain them, because that's the business I'm, I'm in, but also entertain them in a positive way, so they, 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 we make a positive change in their lives. And I think that this technology as a platform has the uh, huge opportunity to, to, to make people leave and realize other, what other people are uh, experiencing all around the world and, and change people for the better. And I think that's the, it's a huge challenge to find ways to, to use VR, um, I would say, other than use, a, use VR in other ways than just um, killing people or you know, just uh, using it as a game, as most games are. So entertain, educate and also make meaningful experiences out of it. That's my biggest challenge, I would say. And uh, personally, I have, um, it's a long ongoing research and I'm not sure exactly where it's going, but I have a fascination for the sublime, for the, the, the things in nature that we can't really understand, the scale of the deserts and mountains and oceans and the, all these forces that form the, the, the world we live in. And I'm trying to understand a little better the, this sense of sublime and, and sort of communicate it in some, some of my works, like some of some drawings. And, and I guess the end uh, goal is maybe to, uh, it sounds a bit cheesy, but to make people realize uh, uh, how, how amazing this, this space is and how maybe we could sort of tr at least try to, uh, to not destroy it too much. So I've sort of started using solar panels and um, it's just a, a, the beginning of a research process, so it's, it's very early yet, but I guess if I had to scrap all the installations I do and choose one topic, that would be uh, try to sort of uh, make more sense of this sublime in nature. <laughs> Personally, uh, <laughs> for me, I mean, this is getting very personal, but I'm very <laughs> aware of my impending death. So it's m more about how I do it rather than what I do. Uh, just doing it gracefully. And in terms of impact, I think it's more about just mind expansion, just expose um, people to things that they haven't been exposed before so that they just have uh, just, just another perspective on life in, in general. That's it. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think we are way <laughs> beyond our time. Yes? Okay, thank you so much for listening. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>